Hi, everyone. Um, I actually am going to be the next speaker, but I have to introduce myself. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm Dr. Verma, and I'm from Clearwater, Florida. And I'm uh, double board certified in family medicine and integrative medicine. And I opened up my integrative uh, practice about five years ago. I was a traditional MD. I had practiced family medicine in uh, Jersey, then moved to Miami, and then I settled in Clearwater about 12 years ago. And I worked for an outpatient practice, and it just wasn't fulfilling. So at that time, I had gone through some challenges in my life. Uh, I was going through a divorce, and my dad had passed away, and I thought I really needed a good change in my life. So I decided to open up my integrative practice. So it's my five-year anniversary now, and. I became licensed to prescribe medical marijuana last year after the, the bill was passed in Florida. So I, my practice is a conglomeration of things. I don't really focus on one thing. Uh, it's, it's a cash-based practice, and I do um, integrative consults. I sit with the patient. It allows me, you know, insurance has no restrictions. So I get to sit with the patient, and I do everything from hormones to gut health to thyroid, adrenals, you know, weight loss, detox. I do IV therapy, uh, BHRT. I have a hypobaric chamber in the office. I do the PEMF mat. I just recently introduced some aesthetics as well. And then, of course, medical marijuana. Um, so I was really interested in that based on just the knowledge and my upbringing, uh, being Eastern Indian. So I really wanted to look into that. And I see my patients uh, who come, everything from HIV to cancer to PTSD. And um, we start them on that. So, and I do a lot of CBD as well. So I named my, the topic, when I had spoken in um, Hollywood, Florida on the spring, it was more of a general uh, lecture on CBD. So I'm not going to really do too much science like my, the previous uh, Dr. Komarnitsky did. It's going to be a little about the history of cannabis and its effects on mental health. We do see a lot of PTSD and anxiety, and I thought this is a really important topic to address uh, because... So many people are refractory uh, to the treatment with pharma, and what are some other ways we can help people who suffer from PTSD and anxiety? The learning objectives I thought I'd explain are basically the science behind cannabis and the innate receptors, which we got a little from the first talk, on the brain and the body, to educate about the ECS, or the endocannabinoid system, and the receptors that play a part in the treatment with uh, the mental diseases. And I wanted to also illustrate specifically how cannabis can relieve the symptoms of anxiety and PTSD. So I like this quote. This is by Charles Baudelaire. He was a, a pioneering translator for Edgar Allan Poe, actually, and I just found this to be interesting. The brain on marijuana will never deviate from its destined disposition or be driven to madness. Marijuana is a mirror reflecting man's deepest thoughts and magnifying mirror. It's true, but only ever a mirror. It's a little deep, but I thought it was interesting when I, we actually get into the physiology of how cannabis works in the brain. This I thought was interesting as well because we often talk about getting a high from marijuana. So this quote I, I like, this is, marijuana enhances our minds in a way that enables us to take a different perspective from the high up, to see and evaluate our own lives and the lives of others in a privileged way. Maybe, maybe this euphoric and elevating feeling of the ability to step outside the box and to look at life's patterns from this high perspective is the inspiration behind the slang term high itself. I always like to do a brief history of this because I think there's so many misconceptions and myths that need to be dispelled. And um, when, during my research over the past year, I find a lot of, you know, there's little conflicting um, data for the dates, but... They go back as far as 6,000. I've seen some uh, places mention as far as 10,000. But the point is, uh, this was being, cannabis was being used uh, prolifically in India and China as far back as these dates. And bang, which is uh, the Sanskrit Hindi word for cannabis, is actually one of the five sacred plants in Hinduism. It's mentioned in the Vedas. It's actually associated with Lord Shiva. Uh, if anybody knows anything about Hinduism, He's one of the gods in the Trinity. He's the god of destruction. And he's actually seen, uh, there's a, the marijuana leaf is one of the symbols. And he's known to drink the, the milk of the marijuana plant. As uh, history proceeds, then uh, it makes its way across to the Middle East, makes its way over to Europe, in Egypt, Rome. We have the Vikings started to use it. It was in Russia. 
Marco Polo, when we started, you know, moving into the, the Western Hemisphere and discovering the New World, we had, you know, it being taken over to the, to the New World, or the Americas. Linnaeus was the one who actually gave it the scientific name cannabis, the Latin name. And in the 1800s, as far back as the 1800s, the plantation, in America, there were many marijuana or cannabis plantations that flourished. We call it cannabis. They didn't, that term marijuana wasn't being used yet. But something changed in the early 1900s, and that's when pharma came, um, started to displace natural methods of treatment for you know, neurological disorders. And the most important thing was the Mexican Revolution that came and basically criminalized marijuana. And this was, marijuana being criminalized was as a result, it was a result of xenophobia. It was basically, we were looking for ways to control immigration, and it was basically a play that was borrowed out of the San Francisco playbook where they had restrictions on opium to control Chinese immigration over there. So this was just a reason to search, detain, and deport the Mexicans back. And um, one place I read that, we, since we had called it cannabis, and when they came, their term was marijuana. So they didn't put two and two together, and they realized, okay, this new culture is coming, they're taking advantage of the, the women, the American women, and this kind of started the whole process of the criminalization of marijuana and how the po politics get involved. We had the Harrison Act that came in, and then the alcohol ban, so we start slowly seeing, you know, the uh, res restrictions on these kind of substances. It was the alcohol and the opiates, and then by the 1920s, there was more of a worldwide restriction. The Marijuana Tax Act comes along, which makes it harder now. And then in the 70s, uh, Nixon really pushed to have uh, a, the, the war on drugs, basically. And he actually ignored the advice of the Schaefer Commission. This was where going back into the Congress and the Senate, where they actually had suggested that marijuana should be decriminalized because there are potential benefits. However, Nixon overturned that uh, ruling, and this is where we start developing the CSA. The CSA is the Controlled Substance Act. And it is basically the schedule of drugs. So as a physician, we have to have our DEA license if we want to prescribe controlled substances. So there are five classes of drugs. And of course, marijuana, and no surprise, was placed as a Schedule I drug. These Schedule I drugs are basically shown to have no medical benefit and the highest uh, potential to be addicted to. So it's also lumped together with ecstasy, LSD, and heroin. Then Schedule II is meth and cocaine. And then as you go down, we have uh, testosterone is, is Schedule Three. Then you have the benzos and Ambien. Then the cough medicines with the narcotics in it. Uh, Dr. Komarniski had mentioned about you know California being the first state to ban it. They were also the first state to re-legalize it. So just, you know, again, there's so many misconceptions out there, and the, and the goal for me is, of course, to educate, but just to give it, you know, the background of wh why we are where we are today in terms of why it's being federally illegal. Dr. Sanjay Gupta has a lot of great YouTube videos, and he has a, a documentary called Weeds. Um, but at first, he was pretty against it, but then as he did the research, and he'll explain in the documentaries, and he said, I cannot find the harm in cannabis. And he has some nice YouTube videos. I'm not sure if I put it on this slide presentation, but it's worth YouTubing and uh, to see those documentaries. So the classification, I just kind of wanted to simply, simplistically break it down. Cannabis is the overall term. It's the umbrella. And then from there, we split into hemp and to marijuana. So how we classify that is hemp, you know, has more of the CBD versus the THC. So when we talk about hemp products, this is what's legal in all 50 states. This is what you don't need to have a license for, and you can basically buy it anywhere. You can buy it in the store, you can buy it online. I always do tell my patients um, to make sure that everything is physician regulated and pharmaceutical grade. There are so many companies out there that we have to make sure the purity and efficacy, we have to make sure there are no toxins and pesticides. Same thing with nutraceuticals. Uh, as, you know, an MD, my goal is, of course, to optimize health, but also to see if people can get off some harmful pharmaceuticals and get on nutraceuticals. So I always tell them, make sure to see, because there's no FDA regulation, that the, the nutraceuticals and vitamins, even if it's a simple vitamin C or vitamin D, that they should be pharmaceutical grade and physician regulated, because they have the highest standards for efficacy. 
Marijuana, on the other hand, is, uh, contains much less CBD, so it's about 10% CBD, and contains more than 20%. I've seen up, upwards of 35 to 45% of the THC. This just breaks it down a little more, cannabis. So ma marijuana, because it has a THC, is associated with that the high, that psychoactive effect. And uh, tetrahydrocannabinol cannabol is what THC is. And that is the principal psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. And then you have CBD. And then it's going to be sort of inverted when we talk about hemp. You don't get that psychoactive high. In fact, they say that CBD antagonizes the effects of THC because what it does, uh, and I'll get a little bit more into the physiology of it. But CBD works on the cytochrome P450 system. So you have to be careful when we're uh, with patients who are on pharmaceuticals because it, since it interacts with that, it can extend the life of, the, of the, the drug and it won't turn into the metabolites. And metabolites have a typical uh, different action than the initial drug. And with the CYP450 system does, it's supposed to metabolize it and help with the renal excretion of it. So for example, if people are on Coumadin, it can extend the life of, of Coumadin and have more blood thinning effects. So we have to be very careful. So I always advise my patients, make sure you speak with a practitioner, make sure you disclose all the pharmaceuticals that you're on, otherwise you can have interactions with that because of the metabolization. There are also over 100, I've seen 150 other cannabinoids, CBN, CBG, CBV, uh, that are part of the, the cannabis plant as well. So that's going to be important when we talk about isolate versus full spectrum and the entourage effect. So just breaking it down, hemp and marijuana are two varieties of cannabis grown for different purposes. When people say cannabis, they often mean marijuana, but it's not true. Cannabis is the big umbrella. So if you think of it like squares and rectangles, a square is a type of rectangle with four sides, you know, all the same length. So all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. So we have to, we have to understand that hemp is a variety of cannabis, as is marijuana. Just to understand it's hemp and marijuana, and the difference is going to be in the amount of THC and CBD. That's how I simplistically explain it to all my patients. Doing, looking back at the history, I thought it was kind of interesting to see the, the origins of the names that we have. So as I mentioned before, the uh, cannab cannabis is the European you know, name uh, given scientifically by Linnaeus. Ganja is Sanskrit, bong is Hindi. That's, that's pr probably where those terms came from, like bong and things, like, and those other terms, more slang terms. And, and Chinese, we identify through Maranwa and then marijuana, marijuana in Mexican Spanish and some other variations of that, hashish and Arabic. And then terms like pot and weed are more kind of current culture that we started seeing kind of during the hippie era, perhaps. Um, and then also with you know, the youth and the adolescents, there are going to be several different terms. So talking about endocannabinoid system, once the cannabis is ingested, it's broken down and the cannabinoids are released into the body. The human body innately has the ECS. It actually existed before the brain did. They, we can trace it back to the primitive sea sponge, and animals have it as well, too. That's why CBD works well, and I see a lot of patients who put their pets on CBD, their dogs, their cats, to help alleviate inflammation or if they're having cancer or, some, or recovery from surgery. The ECS is, uh, maintains homeostasis in the body, and the body always wants to be in homeostasis. It's going to do everything it can to correct itself and get back to that. And it regulates appetite, energy balance, metabolism, stress responses, immune functions, and the ANS, thermoregulation, sleep, and many other important body systems. And I have some slides that are going to show the distribution of the receptors. So there's CB1 receptors and there's CB2 receptors. So the endocannabinoid system, we have broken down, the CB1 receptors are primarily concentrated in the ANS, so they're more in the brain, like the spinal cord. Then you have the CB2 receptors, which are more peripheral. Uh, a lot of them are in the immune system, the spleen, the lymph nodes, the gut. So that's going to be important to understand with the mechanism of action. THC is the one that binds the CB1 and CB2 receptors. CBD does not. It indirectly modulates it. So it doesn't have a formal binding to that. It's not like a lock and key. It exerts its effects through other actions. And we talked uh, about omega. We talk about other cofactors that are important for that. This picture I like, too, because it's just color-coded. So you can actually see where the CB1 receptors are more concentrated. 
again, in the brain and the ANS and the spinal cord. And of course, there's some peripheral, but the, the green, which is the CB2 receptors, are going to be more peripheral. The endocannabinoid system, I like the slide because it had a lot of the effects just laid out. And when we're talking about the use, when I talk to my patients about it, I always, as an integrative MD, I always stress, there's not just one thing you're going to do that's going to make you feel better. So I always talk to my patients about the four pillars of health. Diet is, is huge for me. I'm a very big plant-based advocate. I am plant-based, and I, I grew up vegetarian. But from all the research and the studies that I have seen, plant-based diets are the most optimal in nutrition. Um, you know, you can't ever be protein deficient. That's not something you're going to see in people. So I tell people to eat as clean as possible to get the optimal, you know, um, levels for protein, iron, and calcium. I mean, that's a whole other lecture I can give, but I, it's all scientifically based. So I do spend a lot of time with my patients talking about diet. Next thing is exercise, maintaining activity. That's really important in terms of overall health and wellness. Proper sleep is important, too. I think a lot of people take for granted sleep, or if people work night shifts, they don't understand the importance and the essence of sleep. Our body is very rhythmic. We follow different rhythms, hormonal rhythms, adrenal rhythms, circadian rhythms. So we can't really mess with that. So it's always important, you know, even as we're aging, to understand we still need about six to eight hours of sleep. Of course, children need much more, 10 to 12 hours. But if we throw off or we get sleep deprived, I mean, sleep deprivation is really like, a, it's like torture. You change the whole body's homeostatic mechanisms, and that throws the body into disarray and chaos. And the last pillar that I stress to my patients is stress reduction. Doing something, you know, we live in a very fast-paced, high-stress world, and some stress is, is okay, um, and we, ha we regulate it. We, you know, we have the cortisol and those kind of mechanisms, but I don't think our adrenals ever fully recover. So if we don't give our, our body a chance to recover and to maintain that homeostasis, it's never going to work synergistically together. So I just came up with those four pillars of lifestyle. So it's on mental and physical levels. So when I'm treating my patient, for example, gut health is huge, and I tell them, you know, if, you're, if you have anxiety, of course, well, let's try the CBD, but I make sure I do a lot of in-depth testing. Omega levels are actually on my standard panel because omega is needed for the endogenous cannabinoids. And without the omega, we're not going to have the proper cofactors to form it. So we have the different types of cannabinoids. We have phytocannabinoids, uh, endocannabinoids, and then synthetic cannabinoids. So phytocannabinoids are obviously derived from the plant itself, so cannabis. The endocannabinoids are what we make in our body, and I think I have some slides. So the two main ones are going to be 2-AG and anandamide. Um, the term anandamide is actually interesting because ananda is the Sanskrit term for bliss, and in Sanskrit, the, the cannabis is actually called, the plant is the giver of joy, the giver of bliss, and again, it was associated, it's associated with Lord Shiva. The other benefits we see on you know, mental levels are you know, anti-psychotic, anti-anxiety. A lot of children have benefited from it for treatment of uh, uh, refractory uh, seizures, and um, it's neuroprotective, cardioprotective. There's a lot of research going on right now to see how it's anti-carcinogenic and how it helps people with cancer, especially brain cancer. There's a lot of um, studies that are being done, glioblastoma. And they're also looking at effects in just general things like yeah, sugar control, cholesterol metabolism, pain relief. Uh, and I'll get to the pain relief in a little bit with, in terms of how it binds to the receptors and the COX-1 and COX-2 immune modulator. So the ECS, as I mentioned before, is a fundamental regulatory system. It existed before the brain. It was named after the research with cannabis. Um, the research is fairly new. There was a lot of research coming out of Israel. Dr. Raphael Meshulam was headed a lot of that, and that really prompted, in the 80s, all this research to be done, and that's when the ECS was formed. So it was named the endocannabinoid system because the term cannabis was already there. And again, it was first identified in the 80s, and it's a system that's composed of neurotransmitters and receptors. And we look at why cannabis works so well with us, because it's an innate system. So we have the receptors, we just need something to feed those receptors. We produce these endo endogenous cannabinoids, and as I mentioned, anandamide, and then 2-AG, the arachidonoylglycerol. Those are the two main endocannabinoids that we have. The ECS receptors will get stimulated and bound to by these three types of cannabinoids. So the ones we produce in the body, the one that comes from the plant itself, cannabis, and then synthetic cannabinoids. 
um, which we're probably familiar with, Marinol. Uh, Pediolex just came out as well, too. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry just released that. The most fundamental and physiological system involved in establishing and maintaining our health is the ECS system. It is virtually present in every tissue and organ in the body. And the goal, as I mentioned before, always is homeostasis. The human body is always going to maintain to balance uh, in her homeostasis between the internal and the external factors. So it does a great job at healing. Our body always wants to heal, so we have to help it along. And again, living in a very fast-paced world where we're not eating properly, we're eating you know, things that aren't even foods anymore, they're processed, we're taking too many pharmaceuticals, we're just not taking care of ourselves. So we're doing a lot of damage to our body. So these are ways we can repair and help our body kind of get on the right track. So again, just another slide to show the three types of um, cannabinoids and then how they work. And they all work, essentially, when it comes down to it, on the ECS system. So it's CBD versus THC. This is where the distinction comes between putting someone on CBD versus uh, placing them on medical marijuana. So in Florida, of course, you have to have a license to do it. So I sit down with the patient. And usually they're referred to me by another practitioner, a neurologist, pain management, and we figure out, you know, everything else that's going on. I don't just sit there and, you know, start the process of applying for their medical marijuana card. I actually do a full consult with them and make them do lab work because, again, we have to look at things in the totality. We're not just going to, I'm not just going to give them CBD or medical marijuana and hope it works because if they have very low omega levels, if they're vitamin D deficient, if they have a lot of inflammation, there's so many things that play a part in it. So I kind of do an overhaul for them. And I do find the patients that do that, and they're all amenable to it, they're the ones who do improve drastically as opposed to just saying, okay, here, go get your medical marijuana or here, take the CBD because you really have to approach it from all different levels, uh, mentally and physically. That's important. And that's, the, that's what integrative medicine is about. It's about the balance and the synergy of mind, body, soul. And for me, that's important because uh, being uh, Eastern Indian origin, integrative medicine is really based on you know, Ayurvedic medicine, which is the world's, you know, arguably the world's most intricate and ancient medicinal system. So a lot of that is really just looking at everything together, the, the totality of it. What's interesting is that CBD and THC actually have the same molecular structure. It has 21 carbons, 30 hydrogens, and 2 oxygens. It's just basically the difference in the arrangement of it. So when we're looking at the biochemical, biochemistry of it, it's just the, the, different in the difference in the arrangement. And this is what makes CBD non-psychoactive and why THC becomes psychoactive. So as I mentioned briefly before, THC activates the CB1 and CB2 receptors, but CBD indirectly modulates uh, that's modulate, not modulate, the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So CBD can increase the level of the body's own endocannabinoids. So I, again, I make sure that overall the, their picture of wellness is up to par because omega is crucial in order to form those. And I, I remember back in the day, like, well, I, they would say, I learned somewhere, you know, they say, just put them on omegas. It just helps with their mood. Never fully understanding why. Now I realize because omega is involved in this, in the ECS system, so it's pretty fascinating. The breakdown of cannabis. So the cannabinoids include CBD and THC, so we're looking at the phytocannabinoids. There are also two other types, uh, the flavonoids, and these are what give plants their unique smell and flavor. Uh, Quercetin, which is a powerful antioxidant, is found, uh, is a flavonoid, and that's usually found like apples and onions. That's a supplement that I use in a lot of my patients. I actually use that as like an antihistamine, uh, where people have allergies or a lot of drainage because it helps dry it up and works on those receptors. Flavonoids in cannabis are called canaflavins, and this I found really interesting. Canaflavin A is 30 times more effective than aspirin in binding to the prostaglandin 2 receptors to reduce inflammation, and Dr. Komarnitsky had touched on this as well, too. So this is another reason why it works so well with pain and in inflammation, and why you don't say, you know, just go take your Motrin or Aleve or aspirin. So these are other added benefits of it. Terpenoids are the kind of the oil-like substance. They naturally appear in plants and animals, and their functions are actually deter parasites, so it can be used kind of like pesticides. And over 100 have been identified in cannabis, and some of the common ones are eucalyptol, limonene, myrcene, pinene. So these are what give it the plants their aromatic. Like when you think of like pine trees, for example, or the lavender plant, these are what the terpenoids consist of. 
So the relationship between the cannabinoids, it has to go through a process. It's not just, you know, you harvest the plant and you just use it. I mean, there's different methods of using it as well, too. Um, and there's different parts of the plant with the buds and the trichomes and the spores and then the leaves of the plant. But you have to procure it, and it's gotten raw, obviously, and it's fresh and it's uncured. So the A part in those are like the, it's like the acidic version of it. So they have some potency, but they have to go through more processes to actually get it to the point where you can make it into like the oil tinctures or into, you know, the creams or whatever. And it, you have to basically go through a drying and a heating product process. And when it does this, it, a decarboxylation occurs. So again, talking, kind of going back to organic chemistry and biochemistry, this is what makes it the active compound. So as you can see uh, at the top, see. so these, all these compounds, when they get dried and heated, the A falls off because it's no longer in that form. And these are the ones that are the bioactive forms of it. You can also do an additional step, and um, after time being exposed to oxygen and UV lights, it takes it to another form. And there is so much ongoing research. There's really nothing definitive, but there's a lot of research being done and seeing how we can use it and what, how it would work best in certain products, like oils versus topical creams versus sublingual versus edibles. So this is why I think it's important to just kind of understand the process that it, it goes through. The entourage effect uh, is based on the concept that the totality of the therapeutic constituents of the cannabis plant are more effective and powerful than the isolate alone. So we talk about when we say full spectrum, which you might see on the bottles, let's say full spectrum CBD, this is when they're using all the components, all the different uh, cannabinoids in there, versus an isolate, which they're just extracting one of those chemicals. Um, we do use isolate still, maybe things in like edibles or like coffee or cookies or like lollipops. Uh, so isolates are still used, but the entourage effect was termed uh, by Dr. Raphael Mishulam, and it was just to say that if we can use all of it, you know, the, the totality of the products are going to be more than each individual component itself. And some of the other uh, cannabinoids are CBN, CBG, CBL, and of course CBD. There's so many. There's, there's hun there are hundreds of them. And they're all being researched to see how they can help. There are some that are more specific for glaucoma, for example, or some that are being used as anti-emetics and anti-nausea agents. So there's just ongoing research with this right now. So getting into the crux of what why I feel I put my patients on CBD. I have a lot of patients that come to me who, yeah, they want to lose weight, they, they want to detox, but a lot of what I hear is I don't sleep well and I'm really anxious and I'm really stressed out. So I always recommend, you know, after I do the lab work and check their, I do their gut health testing, I do adrenal testing, I do food sensitivity testing, I mean, you name it, I do it all. And not everybody does every single test, but just my standard blood work is pretty intensive because I have the omega level, I have inflammatory markers, the cytokine levels, all those those types of markers which really help elucidate and so they can see the bigger picture. Because most of the time when they, my patients come to see me, they've been to several insurance-based doctors and specialists. And again, I was in my, I used to do that as well too as a traditional MD. Um, and when I trained at, uh, I trained at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, or Rutgers Medical School, I'm from New York, New Jersey, and so I did all my schooling in Jersey. I don't remember ever having, you know, more than maybe an elective, you know, a couple of hours of looking at nutrition and integrative medicine and, you know, the overall wellness and, and lifestyle for the patient. So it's not what we're taught in med school. And as a traditional MD, I knew that was lacking for me because I don't live my life like that. So I'm, I'm always big on practicing what I preach. And when I tell my patients, I do the same exact thing. So when they come to see me and I do all this testing, they're so fascinated because it's just it's so much more. They'll, they'll come in and say, I already had some blood work done. You know, I, I went to Quest or LabCorp and had it done. But it's nothing. It's just their CBC, their CMP, TSH. They're not even looking at the, you know, other thyroid hormones because thyroid health is huge in my practice. I see everybody comes in on, with the, already on thyroid medication or they self-diagnose and they're like, well, I'm gaining weight, I'm losing hair, I have dry skin, I think I have a thyroid issue or adrenal issue. So in this day and age, you know, the internet's pretty powerful and I'm sure as practitioners you see your patients coming in with already several diagnoses. So our job is to help them elucidate that and say these are the other options, these are the natural things. I have so many patients come in for anxiety and they're on Xanax, you know, they're on other types of benzos and antidepressants. 
And while it's fine, and my goal is not to just get them off of everything, it's to explain to them the long-lasting benefits of, of what can happen when they do take CBD and, you know, why they should probably come off of these other medications because in the long run, the CBD is going to be better at modulating their symptoms. So anxiety is a big one. I have a lot of patients also coming in with PTSD and uh, brain fog, the issues with mental clarity. A lot of, uh, most of my practice is, it's 50% male and female, and uh, the crux of it is really middle-aged, but I do see a lot of kids as well, too. Um, and a lot of parents are coming in saying, you know, my child has ADD, I don't want them on you know, the stimulants, what can I do naturally for them? And some have even already tried just buying stuff off the internet, but for behavioral disorders, ADD, those type of things. I, I had one patient, um, her son has uh, autism and was just basically nonverbal, didn't communicate, and was having a difficult time in school. So we decided to go through the process, and I told her about medical marijuana. She was hesitant, hesitant at first, so I said, let's just try the CBD whatever you want. You know, I don't ever force my patients to do anything. She did a lot of research. It took her actually four months or so to do research, and then she finally said, you know what, we're kind of at our wit's end. I think we're going to do it. And then a year later, she sent me a report from the school, and it was the uh, behavioral cognitive report. And there was so much improvement in the child. I mean, they were just so thrilled and so happy. And she's like, I wish I started it earlier. But, you know, it's never too late. But it's so important, I think, when I educate my patients as well for kids, because there's so much... Uh, negative, so many negative connotations with uh, the adolescents and youth using it because we often think of potheads and the kids in college and they're just lazy and they just get stoned. So the research right now is more for adults showing the neuroproductive effects, you know, uh, for anti-aging, for Alzheimer's, for dementia. There's a lot of research going on in NFL players, for example, because they suffer from CTE and traumatic brain injury, uh, post-concussions, you know, boxers. But in children, what they're saying is their brains are still forming in adolescence, you know, up to age, you know, whatever, 18, 21, that there's not enough evidence to see what the, the CBD or the marijuana is doing. So that's why they think because there's not enough evidence and their, their brains are still forming and they're very impressionable in terms of the neurogenesis capacity, it might not have the same types of effects as it does in terms of the neuroprotective benefits in adults. So I read about that because a lot of pe uh, you know, people always fear, like, well, I don't know if I should put my kid on it because of this. So again, it's something that you have to really, as a practitioner, be comfortable talking to the patients about and understand the science behind it and explain to them and guide them through it. Because a lot of people are going to do things on their own as well. For anxiety and PTSD, which I'm going to concentrate on now, the Latin term anxietas is from the root word angere, which is, means to like choke or throttle, kind of suffocate. It's an, an emotional state that's induced by perception of danger. It's necessary for the survivals in animals, or animals, humans, to protect from threatening situations. The statistics show that over 18% or about 40 million Americans suffer from anxiety. And right now we're on the DSM-5, which are the classifications of these disorders. And they break it down into three main areas. So anxiety, we have the social anxiety, selective mutism, uh, specific phobias, you know, whether it be agoraphobia with panic and general anxiety disorder. Then the second category is OCD, that's like body dysmorphia, hoarding, trichotillomania, the, the hair eating issue, excoriation, you know, scratching until you're kind of bleeding raw. And then we have trauma and stress, and this is where PTSD falls into. So they basically um, made the categories a little more specific. They didn't just lump everything together. But PTSD, we have reactive airway disease, disinhibited social engagement, ASD, and then adjustment disorder. So these are the three types of categories we see in DSM-4. So a lot of patients will have seen their therapist or psychiatrist and already been on a lot of different uh, types of medications. I do a lot of genetic testing as well, so I do pharmacogenomics, and one of the big tests that I do is for mental health. So for people coming in and they've been on SSRIs or TCAs or benzos, the test shows them you know, their genetics and how they're able to metabolize it, and it gives them a little more extra oomph to say, well, you know, I really shouldn't be on this because it's Genetically, it's not right for me, and that's why I'm not feeling right on it. And as you know, if you put pay people on SSRIs, you can have you know, one person on Zoloft and they feel great, and another person feels suicidal. So genetics, even though it's responsible for only about 20% of what happens to us, it is an important 20% uh, that you know, if we don't take care of ourselves, I, I tell my patients about epigenetics, we turn the switch on or off. So we want to make sure that 
we educate our patients as well too and tell them that even though genetics is a small part and parcel of what happens to us, it can be the most powerful thing if we don't take care of ourselves. So uh, there's just so many components when I'm guiding my, uh, my patients. The pathogenesis of anxiety and PTSD goes down to the molecular level, the cellular level when looking at the neurotransmitters. So we have either overactivity or underinhibition of the neurotransmitters. I do a lot of neurotransmitter testing as well too. So I do like GABA, the glutamate, the histamine, the norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. So that's really important as well for patients to see what's going on. Um, and everybody has imbalance of the neurotransmitters. I mean. You know, for my menopausal women, when I put them on progesterone, for example, you know, it's, uh, helping now with the GABA receptors, so it helps with promote calmness and reduction of anxiety and sleep. So when I explain it to my patients that way, then they understand because I tell them this is what your SSRIs or the NSRIs, this is what their goal is to do. So we have to kind of look at your neurotransmitters. When we look at the excitatory ones, it's, it's glutamate, so there's sometimes an excess of it. So that's when, you know, you're kind of like wired but tired, you're kind of always kind of on edge. The decrease in the GABA, which are the more inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, occurs as well too in anxiety. And this is responsible for calmness and relaxation. There's also the excess of norepinephrine, and then we have the fight or flight response, epinephrine, adrenaline. Decrease in serotonin. So I always tell my patients, this is where gut health is huge, because I do, all my patients do gut health testing. Everybody leaves with the, their stool kit and then their uh, blood lab slip. But over 80% of serotonin is made in our gut. So if people's gut health is not right or their diet is not right, then they're not going to feel good. Their mood's going to be off. So we, I call it the happy hormone. So we have to look at, again, all aspects of it. So a decrease in serotonin or 5-HT is going to be responsible for issues with mood and aggression, sleep, impulse, appetite. We also look at the adrenal health as well, too. So I do a lot of the adrenal testing. We look at the cortisol levels, the DHEA, the catecholamines as well thyroid hormones, HPA. I stress a lot on HPA axis, so the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and I you know, have different supplements that I put my patients on, like the Ayurvedic herbs like ashwagandha and rhodiola, holy basil, so that plays a part in it as well too. They say that anxiety and panic are produced by the alpha-2 agonists. Post-traumatic stress disorder is so that was anxiety. Now, with post-traumatic stress disorder, it's a mental condition that develops after experiencing or witnessing a traumatic event. We usually think of PTSD in our vets, but PTSD can occur in anyone who's been through a, a threatening, a life-threatening situation or a frightening situation or event in their life. Those suffering from PTSD will experience severe flashbacks. They can get panic attacks. They have severe anxiety, nightmares, uncontrollable thoughts. They often feel stressed and in danger when there actually is no real threat that exists. It just lingers with them after that initial event occurs. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, other symptoms of PTSD include staying away from places or events that are reminders of that traumatic, initial traumatic event, um, or feeling of numbness or guilt, or losing interest in the former and enjoyable activities are all classifications that occur with PTSD. Being startled easily, always being on edge, and just feeling tense all the time, not sleeping well. Insomnia is a huge part for everybody, but especially in people who have PTSD and anxiety, that's going to play a big role. Currently, PTSD and even anxiety, we treat it with psychotherapy and pharmaceutical medications, which are not always successful. For some people, it is. Uh, so when we're looking at CBD, again, we want to look and see the synergistic effects and see what we can do to amplify the benefits. So remember, not everybody is going to want to come off of the pharmaceuticals, but those who stay on it, we, I explained to them, it can help synergize these effects and work better with the serotonin receptors and the GABA receptors. So right now we look at psychotherapy, and this is a way to kind of, it's in a safe environment, but it's kind of making people re-experience, you know, what initially happened. Um, then the antidepressant medications are often used with that, which can help them maybe curtail some feelings of anger and sadness and the depression. But we have to always keep in mind that these medications will have side effects as well, too. So they can cause you know, headaches and sleeplessness and, or drowsiness and agitation. So we have to be very in tune to what, you know, following up with our patients when we're placing them on these pharmaceuticals. Cannabis has been found in studies to help PTSD patients manage their symptoms. The two major cannabinoids are CBD and THC, and they will help influence the body's innate ECS to help modulate the symptoms that are associated with anxiety and PTSD. So it does play an essential role in the emotional and mental homeostasis of the body. 
It regulates memory consolidation as well, too, with retrieval and extension. So it does help uh, people who have brain fog or clarity issues. The cannabinoids found in cannab uh, the cannabis or activate these specific receptors of CB1 and CB2. And that modulates the release of those neurotransmitters that I mentioned before, whether it's glutamate or it's serotonin or GABA. So that's how it works on that cellular level. And in turn, when they have these effects on the CNS, it can include um, different uh, effects of feeling increased pleasure, happiness, uh, similar to what the antidepressants do. The cannabinoids, they say, block the continuous retrieval of the traumatic effect, and it enhances the extension and reduction in the associated anxiety that we often get with things like PTSD. These effects uh, help PTSD patients manage three core symptoms of condition, which include re-experiencing, avoidance, and numbing, and hyperarousal. So PTSD patients actually saw a 75% reduction in their symptoms, and this was actually measured by a clinical, uh, the clinical administered post-traumatic scale. So we actually monitored these patients, and this is how much, this is what they reported. So there was a 75% reduction. There are, there's evidence to suggest, however, that the benefits of cannabis and PTSD patients go beyond the temporary. So it's actually long-lasting. It's not just kind of in the here and in the now. This is actually something that can prolong and help them throughout life. It's not just a quick fix. So there's a lot of studies uh, showing that the findings support that cannabis has the potential to dampen the strength and emotional impact of those traumatic memories. And also they found that administering the cannabinoids shortly after the exposure to that intensely stressful event will help prevent the development of PTSD-like symptoms. So it's acting right away. It's not allowing months and years to go by. So if someone experiences an event, it's to start it right away because it can help modulate those receptors. The brain area is affected by the cannabinoids, very important. It's amygdala is huge, the hippocampal area is huge. There's a lot of neurogenesis that occurs in the hippocampus, and this is why CBD is really crucial in treating a lot of these symptoms. The cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, so a lot of these things in terms of memory, thinking, the you know, muscle control, coordination. There, you know, there's a lot of talk saying that you know, cannabis is a gateway drug, it's an evil drug. You know, it's a therapeutic plant, and there has not been in the history of the world a death from an overdose of marijuana. Of course, you can get unpleasant side effects if you take too much of it, GI upset, if there's too much THC, you might get paranoia, you know, insomnia, you get that, those awful, you know, psychoactive symptoms. But the reasoning behind why no one dies, of a, uh, uh, dies from an overdose of marijuana is because the concentration of the receptors are not really present in the brainstem. So unlike opiates, where you can overdose on it and you die, is because it's not affecting the respiration or lowering the heart rate to the degree where you will die. So that is why people, you can't die from an overdose of marijuana. It's because of the way the receptors are laid out. Harvard did a, a great study, and uh, the study was called Splendor in the Grass, and it actually showed the beneficial effects of cannabis on the increase of brain function. And this is why there's so much research going on now with how we can use it in the elderly, the geriatric population in terms of enhancing brain function or the NFL players or people who've had traumatic brain injury because of the capacity of neurogenesis that occurs in the brain to help stimulate that and to prevent the onset. Uh, they're looking at Parkinson's, they're looking at uh, MS, they're looking at Alzheimer's dementia. So there's a lot of exciting research that's going on and that, that's, we're at the forefront of that. Currently, the standard treatments, like I mentioned, pharmaceuticals, I just wanted to kind of break it down. I mean, these are some of the things that we've all used or put maybe our patients on or seen our patients with. So benzos and SSRIs are probably the top two things, the newer class of SNRIs. And, you know, if that doesn't work, then we go to, like, the older school antidepressants, so, like, the TCAs. Uh, we have ketamine infusions um, and uh, MAOIs. There's so many different things, beta blockers, that we try to help people with these kind of symptoms. So most of these patients have experienced polypharmacy as well, too. So keep in mind uh, that we have to understand that it's important to assess what they've tried and what they've been through as we guide them and place them on this. So again, not everyone who deals with PTSD is a combat vet because we all have ECS systems. So again, PTSD is any type of situation you've been, been in that will create those 
negative long-term memories, those uh, feelings of uh, fright and threat as, you know, time goes on. CBD relieves physical symptoms of anxiety, too. So, again, mental and physical is always going to go together, so it's important to understand the synergy of the mind, body, soul. So the physical symptoms, it has effects on, you know, relieving nausea, helping with headaches, tingling, makes you just feel overall relaxed. Again, when we're dealing with the CBD and THC, if we're dealing with cancer patients and stuff, when they go to, you know, when we're looking at there's going to be ratios of CBD and THC that are important. So in Florida, when my patients go to the dispensary, the authorized dispensaries, then it's going to be important they, they take care of the ratios and they understand, okay, because if someone is cachectic and they have no appetite, then maybe they need a little more THC because that causes the munchies. So there's going to be a fine balance. And then we have the different strains like indica and sativa. Indica is taken more at nighttime to help with sleep. Sativa is used more during the day for helping with focus and creativity. Again, just keep in mind that all of this research, we're translating from the mice level um, and to really see, but it's translating positively on the human level as well too. And I mentioned all those things, increase in neurogenesis, the cerebral blood flow, decrease in heart rate and blood pressure, communicating with the GABA. They've, they also note that there's uh, elevated amygdala activity in PTSD and this is where CBD can come in and calm that activity down. And they found that low, low fear versus high fear mice was important um, in terms of how they had the anxiolytic effects and, and when they were using CBD. And again, all the other types of uh, DSM-4 classifications like phobia and other anxiety disorders. So I think I'm just about out of time now, but I just wanted to emphasize again that it works with the emotional processing through the regulation of the mesolimbic system and the neurotransmitters. And via the endocannabinoids, it's going to be important because we look at anandamide as playing a very important part in these receptors in the brain, and that's what's going to prolong that feeling of feeling good and having that calmness and happiness. A case presentation was basically um, a 10-year-old girl who was sexually abused and had minimal parental supervision as a child under the age of five, and she was tried on several pharmaceutical medications. And finally decided to put her on CBD, and we saw an abatement in the uh, anxiety and the sleep and a reduction in nightmares. So we need to use clinical data to support the use of CBD when we're treating patients with these. Other health benefits are going to be a lot of benefits in the brain, and as I mentioned before, things with Alzheimer's, restoring cognitive function, increasing cerebral blood flow, maybe preventing stroke, those are all important. And the other ones are, you know, neuropathic pain, treatment in IBD, relieving, you know, pain, glaucoma, improving autoimmune conditions. I diagnosed a lot of autoimmune conditions, you know, Hashimoto's and lupus, what patients never knew that they had. Other benefits, I like this slide because it kind of just gives you the 10 uh, points, you know, they're talking about migraines and PMS and tumor growth. This just kind of sums it up. ADD, which is really important for kids and adults alike. So I just say, you know, you can't buy happiness, but you can buy some CBD, and that's pretty close. And if we just can educate our patients about it and let them know the positive effects and help to dispel the myths and misconceptions that surround it because it's federally illegal, I think that's just we're just getting one step closer to helping our patients achieve some normalcy in their life. These are just all the references. So, yeah, that's done. Thank you.